Hallelujah. Turn that song into a prayer, sincere prayer from your heart, that everything that I have is yours. I give you my heart, give you my mind, give you my body, give you my soul. Someone is praying. When it belongs to him, then he can bring glory out of it. When it belongs to him, he can manifest his power through it. When all of you becomes surrendered, totally surrendered, totally surrendered, then you can be a manifestation of his glory and experience. Someone take a minute to pray. Pray this song from your heart. Any part of the song you still found locked up in your spirit, turn it into prayer. Turn it into prayer. Ya Yesu kaine haskena In the kapi hanyane zambi Ya Yesu kaine haskena My light In the kapi hanyane zambi one more time, ya Yesu, yeah. ya Yesu, kaide haskena in the kabi, in the kabi hanya nan zambi, ya Yesu, kaide haskena, ya Yesu, kaide haskena, shala bako sabranda bako, in the kabi hanya nan zambi, one more time. Ya Yesu kaine Ya Yesu kaine Haskena It is in your light in that we see light In the kabi hanyan Ya Yesu Ya Yesu kaine Haskena In the kabi In the kabi hanyan Father tonight we pray that we will see light in your light you are the light of the world and you have also called us light. We pray that your word will come with power tonight. Transit us to higher dimensions in the spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we submit ourselves, our minds to your word and we contend for transformation tonight. And to Jesus be all the glory. Amen and amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone to those here and to those connected across the globe. You will keep going from strength to strength because you appear before the Lord even in Zion. One scripture very quickly, this scripture was quickened in my heart as I prayed for tonight's meeting, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. When God speaks like this, I believe that it is a prophetic word for someone. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. I believe that this comes as a prophetic word to encourage someone to plant in you that seed to stay and remain, to remain resilient, to remain consistent. The Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing. It says, for we will reap not any day, not every day, in due season, if we fail not. Hallelujah. May that be a prophetic word for you, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It matters that we submit ourselves to the word of God. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, Jesus speaking to Satan said, Man shall not live by bread alone. There is a bread component to man's living, man's survival, man's excelling. But it says, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, by every word, that means every word that comes out of the mouth of God is a survival strategy. Every word that comes out of the mouth of God is a survival strategy. Do not forget this. 
Every word that comes out of the mouth of God is a survival strategy. You know, I was thinking through the things that I'll be sharing tonight and I had to take a deep breath and just, you know, cry out my heart in prayer that God will help the Koinonia Global Family first and then the body of Christ to really understand the reality of the times that we're living in right now. The times that we're living in will test everything you know and we will reveal how much you do not know. The times that we live in right now will test everything you know and will go further to reveal how many things you do not know. Hallelujah. Everything. The world that we live in today is not the world that we had 10 years ago or 20 years ago. The Bible tells us the things that characterize the end times, that knowledge will increase. With that knowledge would come wickedness, every fabrication of evil that the heart of man can conceive. And for you to survive these days, not the days coming, the days we are now in, you need bread for the journey, but you need the proceeding word of God. And God speaks to men by his spirit, but he speaks to men through men. Hallelujah. He told Moses, he said, I have seen the affliction of my people by reason of their taskmasters, and I am come down. And yet we never saw him physically, but we saw the man, the sent man, Moses. Hallelujah. And so every time you are in church, don't have the mentality that you're just coming for service to honor a religious program or sign a psychological register. See that God is about to hand you another key that becomes the basis of your fortification, the basis of your walking and living in victory. Hallelujah. That demands not only your attendance, it demands your rapt attention, your undivided attention. It is in his light that we see light. But believe me when I tell you that for every believer, the things that you know will be tested in light of the days and the times that we're in now. If you claim you have found the key to living and walking in health, it will be tested. If you claim you have found the key that puts a man in victory in spite of the vicissitudes of life, life will test it. Some of you are already going through that school, testing everything. If you claim you know God, life will test it. You claim you love God, life will test it. You claim you want to serve God all the days of your life, life will test it. You claim you love him in spite of abundance or otherwise, life will test it. Hallelujah. That means that everything you receive in a house like this, you don't just let it pass through this ear and fly out through the other ear. The Bible says ever learning huh? and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. There are such people as so. They are ever learning. Yes, sir. Preach, preacher. Tell them. And all this. And at the end of it, they go back with absolutely nothing. What did you learn today? Ah, it was a powerful service, my God. What exactly did you learn? Just believe me. I'm the one who knows what I learned. Hmm. Hallelujah. So it is very important that we understand that every proceeding word from the Lord to you is meant to equip you, to transform you, to transit you. I told you that revelation creates transitions. That every time the word of God comes to you as rima, as revelation, it stops you from remaining at that point. Stops you from remaining in that position or stops you from remaining in that condition. Because the proceeding word is also the sent word. And the Bible says he sent forth his word and his word he let them. He never said he healed all. He healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. 
So I pray for you tonight already. May tonight's teaching profit you greatly. Amen. Shout a believer's amen. amen. Hallelujah. What we teach in this place is the wisdom of God. It's important for you to appreciate this. What you hear in koinonia is not mere information. It's not just mere Bible discussion or intellectual discussion. What you hear is called the wisdom of God. And 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 7, I believe, says it is the wisdom of God that has been ordained for our glory. There is a kind of wisdom that was ordained for the glory of the saints. There is useless information, even if spiritual, because it does not sustain the power to profit the saints in light of real life circumstances. But there is the wisdom that has been hidden, reserved for the saints, revealed by the Spirit. And the Bible says there is an ordination upon that wisdom. That God has, through that wisdom, ordained that when we find access to that wisdom, our lives will be an expression of his glory. Perhaps I should teach you very quickly that there is a difference between knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. I think we should start from there tonight. There is a difference between knowledge, between knowledge understanding and wisdom and i'll tell you the difference knowledge is simply a coordinated gathering of information access to information is called knowledge knowledge is very important because that is the foundation of wisdom there cannot be wisdom without knowledge there cannot be understanding without knowledge understanding only finds its value when you have knowledge are we together the assignment of wisdom is to bring within your, the assignment of knowledge is to bring within your space information that can be profitable. Please listen. God is building us already. The assignment of knowledge is to bring to your space or to bring to your consciousness knowledge that can profit you. Doesn't mean it will profit you, but it is knowledge that can profit you. You have that now? Now the next step after knowledge is understanding. What is understanding? Comprehension. Comprehension. The working dynamics. The working dynamics that release the profit captured in that knowledge is called understanding. So if all you have is the gathering or the consciousness of an information, you may have knowledge, but you will have the same destiny as an ignorant person. And this is what a lot of believers, a lot of believers keep priding and bragging, I know, I know. And yet the results clearly show that we do not know. So knowledge gives room for understanding, comprehension. What do you comprehend? The working dynamics, deriving the principle that connects the dots, the information you have now gathered, the principles that release the profit factor in that knowledge. So knowledge has to do with the gathering, coordinated gathering of information, useful information. Understanding has to do with comprehension. Understanding the principles connected to or the principles that activate that body of truth you have now found. But wisdom is very different because wisdom has to do with engaging the practical aspect of engaging what you understand. The correct application. Are we together now? Wisdom has to do with applying what you have understood. The knowledge you have now understood. If you have the grace and the intelligence to engage it for your profiting, it is called wisdom. So when there is no action, it is not wisdom. You see that now? I know that this is what God wants me to do. All right? I move past the realm of knowledge to understanding. And then I understand the dynamics of how to engage it for my profiting. But I can have knowledge and understanding and still be barren of results. It is when I apply wisdom 
engaging it they heard the word just like we did the bible says but the word did not profit them that means the word had profit in it but the word did not profit them why not being mixed with faith engaging the word for your profiting is where wisdom comes so most people say i have wisdom what they just mean is i have a better information than what you have that is still not wisdom the fruit of wisdom is seen in its ability to impart grace upon you to engage the word until it works for you. That is the reason why wisdom is connected to mighty works. You see that now? When you have wisdom, it is connected to mighty works because the proof that you have wisdom is that you know what to do and you do it. It says, now that ye know these things, blessed are you if you do them you are not blessed when you know what scripture is that now that you know these things blessed happy are you if you do them very very important there are many believers that know what to do but they don't pay attention now that you know these things john 13 yes yeah, 17 thank you if you know these things happy in fact give us niv I think it presents it in a way that it says now that you know these things you will be blessed if you do them not if you know them now that you know them your problem is not a knowledge problem in fact it may not even be an understanding problem a wisdom problem is that you have not sustained the grace to engage consistently until it delivers are we together so when Jesus says, I will build my church. Immediately, you know that that is wisdom personified speaking because it is through wisdom anything is built. When he says, I will build my church, it means you cannot take away the wisdom component from the believer's experience. There is no other way the believer is built if you take wisdom out of the way. Hallelujah. Are we learning? So have this at the back of your mind that the teachings you are receiving particularly this year are survival strategies. They help you to thrive. They help you to survive and to excel even in this bedeviled world that we live in right now. And I'm praying for you in the name of Jesus that tonight's teaching will be no different. You believe that? Shout a louder amen. amen. Tonight I'm teaching on a topic that seeks to help us become better reflections of the Christ, Jesus Christ himself. It's a very powerful mystery I want to show you. It will help you if you desire God, if you desire to be a person of stature spiritually, if you want your becoming like Christ to be very methodical, then tonight's teaching is for you. I'm teaching on the spiritual man the spiritual man Romans chapter 8 and verse 6 the spiritual man the Bible says for to be carnally minded is death to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace that means the only way to truly find life and with it peace is to be spiritually minded Second scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll read verse 14 to 16. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You are the king. There is none other. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, you are the king, there is none other. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Very powerful song. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, you are the king, there is none other. Yes, Lord. It was in the place of meditation many years ago that this song came 
I remember, still remember like yesterday, resting my head, meditating late into the night. And this song just came like a stream from heaven into my spirit. It's a song that acknowledges his lordship, that it doesn't matter what happens in the world of men. He is still king, he is still lord, and there is none other. Many, many people can rise and claim to be kings and gods, but there is only one king. You believe that? Hallelujah. 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 You are God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus not every believer can be a reflection of the glory of the Christ in experience God intends for everyone it's in our prophetic destiny corporately as believers to step into this realm and this dimension in the spirit where our lives become a worthy capture. The Bible tells us that the life we have received is abundant life, life to its fullest. But you and I will never be able to come into the experience of being reflections of the Christ experientially. And the reason is because not every believer is able to capture and host the fullness of Christ in experience. Being a believer is profitable, but just because you have become a believer does not mean, please listen carefully, that your Christian experience will be a perfect representation of God's intention. The same way a student gets admission into college or any school at all, any institution, just because the student has his admission letter, bona fide admission letter, does not make the person a doctor or an engineer or an architect are we together now the person is in school the admission letter is there valid in fact but the moment the person is admitted are we together the transition in knowledge from one department one faculty one school of thought to the other until the curriculum allotted to award that degree is exhausted by that person this is how it is spiritually so there are many believers who are saved and the only reason why you believe they are saved was because you saw them when they were making the altar call else there is nothing captured in their 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 faith walk that justifies that they actually encountered christ it ought not to be so it is possible that you can be genuinely saved but everything around your life speaks otherwise to a point that people doubt your salvation and say, I'm not sure you have encountered the Christ. And the reason is because most believers sadly have been taught that all there is to the believer's experience is to get saved. And I've taught you here that that is only the initial step. That just because you have received the life of God does not mean you are manifesting the Christ or reflecting that life. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19, Paul the apostle was speaking to believers who were already saved. These were believers he was mentoring. And guess what he told them? My little children, he said, of whom I travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you. He's speaking to people who already received eternal life. And now he's talking about another reality, the formation of Christ. He's saying, I'm like a woman in labor, 
a woman who is about to give birth and all the constraints. He's saying, this is how much I constrain myself with one desire to see the Christ formed in you. That means something happens to a believer who is not led through the path that leads to the formation of Christ as you'll be learning tonight. The quality of the believer eventually in his faith work is not just dependent on the truthfulness of his new birth experience but the degree to which Christ is formed in that person. And the Bible identifies three kinds of believers. I want you to walk carefully now with me. Three kinds of believers. Number one, the Bible lets us know that there is what we call a natural man first and foremost. That one is not even a believer. In fact, let me put it this way. There are three kinds of men from a spiritual standpoint. So men are categorized in three. There is number one, the natural man. Say after me, the natural man. Don't assume you understand what I'm saying. Say after me, the natural man. Right? So the Bible tells us that there is such a man as the natural man. In Romans chapter 8, please give it to us from... Um, There is the carnal man. Let me just list all three and then I begin to deal with them and get them out of the way. So there is the natural man and there is the carnal man. Everyone say the carnal man. One more time, say the carnal man. And then the third kind of man is called the spiritual man. Now you give us Romans chapter 8, please. 6 to 8. We read verse 6. Now we'll read down to 8. For to be carnally minded, it says, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. You see that now? For it is not subject. It tells you why that mind is carnal. We're coming there. That it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Verse 8. It says, so that they that are in the flesh, and not that description for being carnally minded, cannot, not that they don't want to, that they cannot please God in that state. Are we together? First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. We read that scripture earlier on. But the natural man, everybody say the natural man. So there is such a man as the natural man. And the Bible says what makes that man natural is that he's not regenerate. Are we together? He's an unsaved person. It's a spiritual language to mean the man that has not encountered Christ. He has not gone through what we call the new birth experience. That man may be a nice man. He may be someone who is societally accepted as a good man. But the moment you have not come into Christ, by receiving the life of Christ, the Bible calls you a natural man. And he's saying no matter how good such a man is, there is a deficiency that he does not have the faculty of receiving the things of the Spirit of God. You know why? For they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because spiritual things must be spiritually discerned. So there are many good people, for instance, who will listen to a good sermon. Perhaps such as I'm preaching now. And as much as they appreciate the teaching, it doesn't make any sense. You know why? Because when it has to do with the business of spirit living, it is not just something that is, is hinged and stops at the realm of intellect. There is an engineering that the Holy Spirit the life of God does to an individual that gives you the faculty to both perceive, appreciate, and believe spiritual things. And if you are a natural man, you are not saved. I can tell you, you can sit down and wonder why are people crying? Why are people rolling in worship, for instance? Why are people quoting scripture and speaking them? It does not make sense. The end point for a natural man is you become critical, you become angry, you become offended because spiritual things don't make sense to such a man. You will find problems with almost everything in the Bible. 
And the reason is because you are only looking at it as a piece of literature or an archaeological material like you have been taught or a historic material. The life, the spirit component within it cannot profit you. You will read scriptures like there is he that scattered and yet increased. There is he that withholded and it tends to penury. It won't make any sense to you. You would read scriptures like, you know, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it doesn't make sense. How do you call upon the name of a God you do not see and then you are saved? The natural man. Our world is full of many natural men. Some of them are good men, quite honestly. And yet they are natural men. The destiny of the natural man, the man without Christ, is eternal doom. Let me press that again. The destiny of the natural man, the man without Christ, based on the authority of scripture, is eternal damnation. In spite of the good works, in spite of the sincere heart, it is the reason why Jesus, watch this now, Jesus came and made a way through his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, he opened up that way that everyone who is not in Christ can now find his way through what we call the new birth experience. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe that God raised him from the dead, Romans chapter 10 from verse 8 to 10, it says, thou shall be saved. For with the mouth, the Bible says that confession is made unto salvation with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation let me pause here for a minute and announce again to our world truly a day is going to come upon the earth where those who are not in christ will be doomed for eternal damnation we can argue this we can create a lot of philosophies there are many intelligent dissertations debates that have spanned through centuries debunking this reality but let god be true and every man a liar it is going to happen one day upon the earth that all those who had a chance to hear the gospel it is the reason why we continue to frontier the course of the kingdom helping people understand that jesus has come as savior as an expression of the love of god to them the only solution to man's state that he is not even aware of it says for all have seen how many all aware or otherwise all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus has come as a mediator. He didn't just come to inform us. He actually died. The Bible says so. He died. This is the gospel. I just felt burdened to just press it so that we don't just brush through the idea of a natural man. Something is wrong with such a man, spiritually speaking. Something may not be wrong with such a man financially speaking. Something may not be wrong with such a man intellectually speaking. When you look at the natural man, just from the eyes of a natural man too, you can see an excellent man. Maybe an excellent father, maybe a well-intentioned mother, maybe a, a, an intellectually vast individual. But we are looking from the lens of the spirit that anyone who is not in Christ is not saved. He is not saved because there is damnation that awaits all men. The only remedy is Jesus Christ. This is not a religious idea. This is truth. One day all men will be forced to acknowledge the fact that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords indeed. It is the reason why we spend ourselves, our lives and we are spent to help the nations to see that there is a way out. This is not a ministry assignment. This is not a religious fanatic assignment. It is a matter of urgency. I told you the greatest need of an unbeliever is not accommodation. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not education. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not even solving their hunger problem at the moment. All those are profitable, but the greatest need of an unbeliever is introducing him to Jesus and praying that he or she out of their will will accept this substitutionary sacrifice he who has the son has eternal life he who has the son 
has eternal life. Only he who has the Son has eternal life. I have the Son, so I have eternal life. You see that? So there is such a man called the natural man. He can be the natural man as a distinguished professor. The natural man as an intellectual. The natural man as a successful career person. The natural man as a mentor to heads of state and heads of government. A natural man as a millionaire and a billionaire. A natural man as an inventor. That is true. But from a spiritual standpoint, any man that is not without that is without the Christ, unregenerate, is called the natural man. It is not an insult, it is the description of a spiritual state that is in need of urgent attention. Now, for those of you who have been involved in any kind of charity or humanitarian work, when you go to places that are really impoverished, the health standards really low below average. Did you know that sometimes you can see the little children running around, no shoes, no, no shirts, playing football around, and you see all kinds of sicknesses, maybe sores, maybe, you know, eczema or something on the children. They are not even aware they are sick. Are we together? Because that level of life does not even afford them the privilege of awareness. It is when the doctors or the medical people, the missionaries come in, as soon as you look at the children, some of those children have... They are, they are sick to a point they are almost dying. They are not even aware. That is how the natural man is. The natural man is not even aware of his spiritual state. Are we together? Yes. So when you who is in Christ and have been given this mandate of world evangelization, when you meet such a man, you look at that man from the lens of this description that I just gave you. Like a compassionate humanitarian person looking at a small child, malnourished. The child does not know what is the cause of this lack of energy draining even unto death. Sometimes they administer, you know, medical treatment to the child immediately. Because the child is not even aware that he's just hours left. Listen, if you begin to look at the world of unbelievers that way, my life changed when I found a new name for unbelievers. I don't call them sinners. I don't call them unbelievers. Something happens to you when you call sinners, sinners. It puts you in a state of self-righteousness and you cannot win them. Jesus calls sinners harvest. The moment you change that name, it changes your orientation. Because in the mind of God, Every unbelieving person is ripe for harvest. So he calls them the harvest. I did a teaching on that. You can get, um, you can go to Koinonia Global. It was one of the teachings that we had in UK. The harvest is very important. So when you see a smoker, provided you are seeing a smoker or a prostitute or some, some um, um, what they call it, some occultic person, what will come out from you to them is resentment, not compassion. But the moment you see them as a harvest, then you see them from the lens of Jesus, like a sheep without shep. Everyone say the natural man. In the midst of the thousands of people gathered here in this auditorium and all across, and the many who are following, I can tell you by the integrity of scripture, there are natural men hearing me now. There are natural men listening to me now. Well-intentioned people. They came to church. Were gladly invited. Knowing that there is something missing in my life. You are right. It's a natural man. But the good news is that the possibility of transition still exists. That a natural man can leave that state. And I'm praying for you in the name of Jesus. That you will not return back home as a natural man. That if there is anybody here who is not saved, when it is time for the altar call, don't let the devil deceive you, distract you, and make you feel, I think I'm ashamed, I think I'm afraid. The natural man has the eternal destiny of damnation. It's true. I saw the great and small stand before the Lord. The Bible says, 
books were opened and another book was opened and whoso's name was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire that burned with brimstone and sulfur the Bible called it the second death I want you to know that this whole thing about the eternal destiny of believers is not a church concept it's not a Pentecostal concept. It's not a charismatic concept. It's not an evangelistic concept. In fact, it is not even a Christian concept. It is a matter of your destiny before now. That your destiny, watch this now. You came from somewhere. I hope you know you did not just appear. Yes. And the one who was there before time begun, is the one who is making a way for you now to sort your eternal destiny. The destiny of everyone without Christ when our time here on earth is up is eternal damnation. When he, the spirit of truth, comes to the natural man, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Are we together? He will let you know that you don't need to be this way again. That Jesus Christ has come as an expression of the love of the Father. Number two, let's hurry up. The second kind of man that the Bible identifies is one who is now saved. Watch this now. Saved but not transformed. Saved but not under submission to the word of God. Saved but not under submission to the lordship of the Holy Spirit. A man that is driven by his senses. The Bible calls this man the carnal man. So write that word down please. The carnal man. This is the second kind of man that we have. The carnal man is actually a believer. He's one who is saved already. But something is still wrong with that person. The administration of eternal life in the experience has not been furnished in such a man. Please listen carefully. A carnal man is not necessarily an unbeliever. He's one who has answered the altar call truly from a spirit standpoint. He has received the life of Jesus. Are we together? But the outworkings of that life has not found expression in his life. And there are a few things that characterize the life of a carnal man. Number one is the absence of transformation by the word. The first way you know a carnal man is the absence of transformation by the word of God. Don't forget this. The absence of transformation by the word of God. He has not sustained what the Bible calls the mind of Christ. He is not spiritually minded. The carnal man has a mindset. In fact, what principally defines carnality is mindset. Romans 8, 6. To be carnally minded, we read that earlier on, is death. To be carnally minded. A carnal person is one who has a carnal mindset. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Such a person is still alive to self and the desires of the flesh. Write that down. Such a person is still alive to self. I have taught you that there are two things that you deal with as you sojourn this path of faith. Number one is a sin problem. Number two is a flesh problem. For the sin problem, you deal with it the moment you receive the life of God. You are declared righteous. You receive an imputation of the righteousness of God in Christ and that nature of sin completely dies and is out of your life. But as a believer, there is still something else to deal with. It is called the flesh. And for that one, you don't cast it out. With one salvation prayer, the sin problem is done. But the problem of the flesh can live with you all the days of your life, even as a Christian. Paul says, as, as touching the matters of the flesh, he says, I die daily. I die daily. Two, he says, I put my flesh under subjection. There is an active participation on my own part to keep my flesh at bay. Many believers do not understand this. And once people are born again, they just believe that because the sin problem is solved, it means I'm all right. No. Listen to what Paul said. Paul the apostle. When you read Romans chapter 8, verse, I mean chapter 7, Paul began to vent out his own frustration. 
He says, listen, there are two laws that are working in my members. Are we together? One is the law of sin and death. The other is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So that the things I do not want to do, this is Paul speaking, I find myself doing them. The things that I want to do, I do not find myself doing them. He was frustrated and he said, oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul was frustrated. This was not a statement of encouragement. Oh wretched man that I am. Why is it that I find myself is like another software that has possessed me, controlling me to do the things that I do not want to do. And the things that I want to do, I don't find myself doing it. And he said, who shall deliver me even though saved from this body of death? Say the carnal man. I submit to you by the authority of scripture that a large percentage of believers are still domiciled in this realm. Unfortunately, for many, hopelessly so. Because the education, the enlightenment, the mentorship, the system of transition that graduates you to become spiritual in experience, most people may never have access to it. So you can be saved for 30 years and only transit from a natural man to become a carnal man and remain there and keep questioning your spiritual life keep questioning your salvation because after 10 15 years you cannot see the value of growth nothing in your life justifies knowing god loving god serving god living for god you look at your life and you look at unbelievers and everything is the same the carnal man he still speaks like he used to speak. He still acts like he used to act. Are we together? Your impulses are fleshly, sensual. That many times people have to remind you and say, are you not a man of God? Are you not a pastor? Are you not a, a, a member of so, so, and so? You say, ah, don't mind me. These are the kind of people that one day will say, listen, let me tell you, don't think because I'm saved, I will remove my clothes here and beat the living daylight out of you. Have you heard people speak like that? And then others who say, this is my church mind. This is my what? That means there is another one. And they are right. Truly, there is another one. <laughs> what is the danger of carnality? I will tell you. The danger of carnality is that your life becomes a consistent misrepresentation of the image of Christ. Your life becomes a consistent misrepresentation of the image of Christ because you are carrying a title that cannot be defended by your life. You are carrying the title believer, the title Christian, but it cannot be defended. So your life, if people are going to learn God through the lens of your life, you become a consistent misrepresentation. Are we learning? Number two, what is the consequence of being and remaining carnal? Your experience in times of results and that of the unbeliever will not be different. Your experience in terms of your journey, your possibilities and your limitations will be almost exactly the same. The profit of your being saved cannot be demonstrated in your life. As a carnal believer. This is a very serious thing for many people. This is the explanation behind the frustration of many Christians. I'm saved now. Why is my life still like this? I will tell you why. Because you have not allowed the spirit of God to transit you. The potential of this life we have received is only seen clearest when it is viewed through the lens of spiritual people. To be carnally minded. And the Bible lets us know that one who is carnal is still a baby. Are we together? Let me show you a scripture. I hope God is speaking to someone. First Corinthians chapter 3, 1 to 4. First Corinthians 3, 1 to 4. And I, brethren, please write and let me have your attention. I could not speak to you as unto spiritual. My God. 
That means Paul is teaching us up front that there is a way you speak to spiritual people. And there is a way you speak to carnal people. Are you seeing that now? Yes. It's the reason why there are many believers who cannot understand many things that are taught. Because they are still carnally minded. And even though they may laugh and carry all the gestures of knowledge and assimilation, the truth is they are not understanding what is being said. Because there are certain discussions that you really have to be spiritual to understand. Back to the discussion. And I, brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Now watch carefully. Even as up to babes, help me, the last two words, in Christ. One more time. There is such description of a believer as a babe in Christ. You are a child even though you are in Christ. He's not speaking to people who are outside Christ. They are in Christ. But he's saying you are still children. Verse 2. I have fed you with milk like a mother feeds a baby. Milk here is talking about elementary levels of spiritual knowledge. And not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear them. Neither ye now are able. Paul is expressing his frustration. He's saying, I've come here many times and there are weightier things to teach you in the spirit. But every time I meet you and I examine you, that means there is a system for examining the state of a believer. You can know that this believer is still a child. Paul is saying, this is a lesson for men of God. When you go to minister to people, Gauge, try to gauge the, the spiritual state of the people so you don't waste your time discussing things that will fall on deaf ears. Give us that scripture. I was not able to teach you. I just had to feed you with milk and not meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither can you bear it now. What is the proof of carnality? Verse 4. Now. Okay, well, let's go to verse 3. Verse 3, it says, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you, now see all the elements of the flesh. He's talking to Christians, envyings and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? He's dealing with the issue of carnal Christians now. If you look at verse 4, to end this, this scripture, it says, For while one said, I am for Paul, another, I am for Apollos, it means that you are still at the realm of men. Your mindset, you are not yet kingdom minded, you are not heavenly minded, you are still men pleasers. These are still elements of the flesh finding expression in you. Are you seeing that now? There are things I want to teach you, he's saying, but I cannot because I found out that in teaching you, I will waste my time. Even Jesus himself wanted to teach the disciples certain weightier matters of the kingdom. But he said unto them, I hope you know none of the disciples were saved. No, they were not saved. They were only being prepared. <laughs> How could they be saved without the Holy Spirit? Are we together now? Just because they were around Jesus did not make them saved. No. If they were saved by what means? It then means we have to cancel salvation. There is no other name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. And salvation is only by the blood, the substitutionary sacrifice. So how could they have been saved? No. Everybody Jesus healed was still unsaved, including the religious people. Are we together? He had to die and become the firstborn of we the begotten. So he told them, he said, I have many things to tell you, but ye cannot bear them now. Ye cannot bear them. Not need, ye cannot hear them. Ye cannot bear them. And I've taught you here that some of those things he wanted to say was what the Spirit inspired Paul to write. You know how hard some of Paul's writings are? That even the disciples said, Kai, this one, ah, this man, this thing is hard, small. Low. So imagine if Jesus were talking to them. They would be saying, preach, preacher. And at the end of it, they would say, let's go out fishing. This guy is talking nonsense and wasting our time here. One of the ways you know you are still carnal is that you don't have the endurance for sound doctrine. The moment sound doctrine is a burden, something in you says, what is all this one now? Can't you just go straight forward? Receive. I'm not being sarcastic, but it's true. 
If I shout now and say, what am I seeing? BMW. <laughs> Koinonia, BMW. Hey! Someone already lifted his hand and carried the hand of somebody and said, that's it. Now, I'm not saying that you receive it. Receive your BMW. <laughs> Are we together? But you see, if the entire journey of the believer is only centered around these kinds of things, there will be a lot of problems. And I tell you the truth, respectfully speaking, that we men of God have been given the mandate by God to transition people from being natural, carnal, to being spiritual. For as long as we keep maintaining carnal membership, the pastor will never rest. One of the proof of carnality is putting your attention on a man and not God. It's the reason why people keep going through all kinds of problems, even in ministry. Because if I tie all your attention to me, I will be in trouble. It means I will never sleep for the rest of my life. Are we together? So my job is to help you. And the greatest way to help you is not just to prophesy to you. The greatest way to help you is not just to pray for you when you are sick. Or be there for you when you have problems. That is very important. It's a very important pastoral duty. But let me tell you, the greatest way to really help believers is to teach them. Bring light, bring understanding, bring illumination. Grant them access to wisdom. The moment believers start growing and maturing, you start resting as a man of God. The same way when a parent invests in a child, are we together? As the child starts growing and is becoming a responsible child, the parent will start resting. There are parents who have children taller than them and yet they will not rest. You know why? Because the child, with all due respect, is ill-trained, and still a burden to the parent. At 40, still a burden. At 50, still a burden. So where the parents would rest, they are not resting because they move from one police station after the other going to bail that child out. This is how it can be. This is not a pastor's conference, but I, I'm just digressing to help you. If you're a man of God here, let me tell you the truth. Don't feel so insecure that you have to turn the attention of everybody on you. It is a risk. You will never be able to find sleep. Help them and guide them and lead them to Jesus. Teach them truth. You are there to supervise, to guide, to coordinate. Are we together? Yeah. Many believers are still carnal. Carnal because of our thinking. Carnal because we are still alive to self. The fleshly desires... We are carnal because we are largely unyielded to God, unyielded to the Holy Spirit. I'm pressing on this carnality so that we'll be able to understand true spirituality. So the natural man is the un unregenerate man. He's not even met Christ at all. Even if he's been around the things of God, he does not have to be a bad man by our definition of being bad, doing anything wrong, society wrong, societally wrong, but the fact that that man is not saved, something is wrong. Eternal damnation is the destiny of that man without Christ. For the carnal man, he is saved, but that the reality, he, is, he cannot be a true reflection of Christ. Are we together? The Bible says to be carnally minded is death. So you watch a carnal man dying, as if he is not spirit, as if he's not saved, and you are wondering, were you really saved? Everything you used to do before you were saved, you are still doing now. No difference, no difference whatsoever. Same talk, same behavior, same places, same relationships, same things. That is a carnally minded man, same philosophies, same insults, same anger, same manifestations of the flesh. There is nothing around your life. If someone did not see you making an altar call and someone comes to meet you one year even after you are saved, they wouldn't know the difference. You will have to tell them, well, um, just to let you know I'm saved now. And they say you are saved? It's a joke. But it's supposed to be clear. The reality of salvation is supposed to have a growing influence within you. Is God speaking to someone tonight? Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. 
It says, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Uh -huh. Verse 2. It says, wherein, he's describing something now. Wherein in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world. Watch this. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. Are you seeing that there are, there are people in this life you see, the things that they do is not counseling that will change it. They need an altar call. Are we together? It doesn't matter what kind of counseling, with all due respect, you can administer superior therapies. It will not change because there is a spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. I've seen people who you counsel and at the point of counseling, they are even crying. And you say, will you do this again? They say, me, no, not at all. In fact, I can tell you today is the last day. That person will get up right where you are and walk right, have you seen that kind of thing? Right there. You can bail the person out of a police station and they'll say, if you return here again, you will not go back. Yes, sir. By the next week, the person is back there. There is a spirit. Please hear me. This is spiritual intelligence. Once you see people doing certain things that they cannot stop, stop wasting your time with counseling. You need to administer another kind of therapy. It's called the power of God. Are we together? Yeah. The person stole 10 naira. You caught the person red-handed with 10 naira there. And the person said, this is the last time. If I do another stealing, may God kill me. God doesn't kill because he knows the man is just talking nonsense. By evening, not the next day, evening. He just sees, and you know these spirits work, these spirits actually create a prophetic expression in their victims. Because you can hide something and the person just stands in the room and just goes to lift the mat. The same way you prophesy. You hide the money, hide it anywhere they will find it. The same way somebody, for instance, not to condemn. All these guys that smoke all kinds of things. As soon as they enter a city, a city they have never gone to, in two hours, they know where their company is. It's a spirit. I know you are laughing, but listen carefully to what I'm telling you. There is a spirit that works in people. The same way there is a spirit that brings trouble, negative things to people. Now, but that is supposed to be the experience of the unbeliever. But you can be a believer. <laughs> Listen, to believe that just because you are saved, demon spirits cannot have access to your mind and your destiny is a joke. Did you hear what I said? Let me repeat it for your learning. It is a joke. They should not. But since you are carnal, there is no difference. So you find out that when you are ministering deliverance, you will see both believers and non-believers under the influence of these spirits. The explanation is provided you still have a carnal software, there is still a gate for Satan to access your life. He may not possess you because the life of God is in your spirit, but he can still find room to manipulate your life even as though you were possessed. So there are many believers moving around and saying it doesn't matter now that I'm saved, I don't need, it's not true. It's not true. Listen to my message, complete deliverance. I teach there that there are three levels of deliverance. There is the deliverance where by the power of God, you cast out the spirit influence. Ideally, that should be to an unbeliever. But number two, there is deliverance through transformation. This is what makes deliverance not needed in your life again. That when you sit down and you are transformed, what part of you is being transformed? Your mind. There is a switch from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded. And now you can partner as an act of your will with the word of God and with the Holy Spirit. And when Satan comes to you because he will come, there is nothing in you that can connect him to you again. But until then, he would deceive you into believing that you cannot be manipulated by spirits. And yet you will find your life, even though you are saved, you will still find your life helplessly under the influence of spirits. Helplessly. Helplessly under the influence of spirits. 
And it does not matter whether you are a preacher. It does not matter whether you are a businessman. It does not matter whether you are an elder in church. Spirits don't have respect for those things. Once you are carnally minded, you are in the realm of Satan. There is a way that carnal people walk. It says who walk according to the cause of this world. There is a way carnally minded people speak. There is a way carnally minded people behave. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. Just because you have obtained grace from God does not mean you will utilize it. You can waste the grace, the enabling grace that was given. It is why every time Jesus saw people and he had compassion towards them, the first thing he did was to teach them. That means the real way to show people compassion the real way to show people to if you desire to take people out of their state your response is not just a prophetic word your response is not just healing your real response to dealing with people's state is to teach them the teaching ministry is the permanent cure for people's state but then related to the teaching ministry the content the spiritual information that you are communicating must be wholesome, doctrinal, balanced, seasoned with power to produce the effect. Otherwise, you'll be creating another kind of error again, which is what is happening sadly across the body of Christ. So we have many teachers, but the content is where the problem is. So there are believers who are learning and receiving, but the problem is not their refusal to receive, is that there is something wrong with the kind of information. Either it is imbalanced or completely wrong. Are we together? What do you do with a carnal mind? What do you do with a carnal person? A carnal person needs beyond counseling. Please let me have your attention. A carnal man needs beyond advice. A carnal man needs beyond just reading a book. What a carnal man needs is to submit himself. Watch this now. To submit himself to the ministry of the word through a teaching priest. And then that process of transition begins until he becomes a spiritual man. Is someone learning now? So you find yourself and you know as I'm speaking that truly I'm still in this realm of carnality. My mind is not purified. My thoughts are not purified. So says my speaking. So says my behavior. Because your mindset is what controls your behavior. Your mindset is what controls your speaking. Your mindset is what controls your appetites. And the moment you find out that you are not manifesting God-like characteristics, I am telling you, the diagnosis is that you are carnal, even though you are saved. But there is a way out. In the name of Jesus, there is a way out. Let's talk about the spiritual man. Pray in the spirit in one minute. Pray in the spirit in one minute. Your spirit opens to me the treasures of your word and I will forever sing your praise. Your spirit opens to me the treasures of your word and I will forever sing your praise. Pray and I will sing of the wonders of your word I will sing out for joy I will sing of the wonders of your word and I will forever sing your praise hallelujah now look up please a spiritual man is not a man open to the realm of the spirit listen carefully when we talk about a spiritual man we don't mean a man who is open to visionary encounters 
or out of body experiences because an occultic man is not a spiritual man even though he's open to the realm of the spirit so when we are talking about spirituality we are not talking about the ease with which you can separate your body from your spirit and interact with the realm of the spirit no if that is your concept you will easily be misled to error i want to define for you the spiritual man from the lens of scripture because for the average believer after dealing with the matters of the natural man and dealing with the carnal man the moment we talk about the spiritual man the first place your mind goes to is the person who leaves his body at will if you can leave your body at will something is wrong with you did you hear what i said if you can leave your body levitate and leave your body at will and come back go for and see a powerful man of God to help you I'm telling you this it's an occultic practice it's not spirituality <laughs> you should have the advantage of the duality of realms of interacting with the realm of the spirit but let me tell you something something always happens to you when you are exposed to the atmosphere of the realm of the spirit the realm of the spirit is not heaven I hope you know that the realm of the spirit is another face another plane of reality that has rules of engagement accessible to all men with or without Christ the condition to be out and interacting with the realm of the spirit is that you must be assisted by another spirit and it does not have to be the spirit of God I will sing of the wonders of your word. I will sing out for joy. I will sing of the wonders of your word. And I will forever sing your praise. What kind of man does the Bible define as a spiritual man? Please write. What kind of a man? If we know that there is the natural man, if we know that there is the carnal man, a believer, and yet a carnal man, and we say that to be able to reflect Christ in his fullness, the condition is that beyond salvation, that transition has to happen in your life until you attain a state, a kind of man that the Bible calls spiritual. Now we're examining such a man. What does it take? How do I know that I am becoming or I have become a spiritual man? Are you ready? There are a few things, features that must be captured within the life of a believer as proof that that person is a spiritual man let me run through the list for you number one any spiritual man you know must have encountered Christ through the new birth experience any man this is why I said a spiritual man is not just one who is open to the realm of the spirit there are many people who are not saved and they can see visions there are many people who are trained traditionally in the village and their organs of interaction with the realm of the spirit by fraternity with demon spirits are opened in a heightened way. They can see you coming from a distance and call your name. The lady, the damsel who had the spirit of divination, her prophecy was accurate and yet she was not saved. Are we learning? So for you to be a spiritual man, number one, you must have encountered Jesus Christ through the new birth experience please write that down you must have encountered Christ Jesus Christ through the new birth experience number two a spiritual man is one who has had an experience with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit you cannot be a spiritual man if you have not encountered the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit these are the factors that produce true spirituality in believers number one 
an experience with Jesus, the son of the living God, the new birth experience. Number two, an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Can I give you number three? The factors that define a spiritual man. A spiritual man is one who has a thorough comprehension of the principles of the kingdom as revealed in scripture. A thorough comprehension of the principles of the kingdom, the ways of God as revealed in scripture. Don't forget this third point. A spiritual man is not just a Bible study giant is one who through the lens of scripture primarily has come into a thorough comprehension of the ways of God, the principles of the kingdom as revealed in scripture. You have that down? So number one, an encounter with Jesus Christ through the new birth experience. Number two, an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number three, a thorough comprehension of the principles of the kingdom, the ways of God as revealed in scripture. Number four, who is a spiritual man according to scripture? Number one, number four, the man who has willingly chosen to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Ah, this is an important one. The man who has willingly chosen to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Just because you have an encounter with God by His Spirit does not mean you have chosen to submit. A spiritual man is one who has willingly underlined that word will. Your will has an active role to play in your becoming spiritual. Willingly submitted to the Lordship, the leadership of the Spirit of God. Mm. Let me tell you the truth. Do you know how difficult it is to truly submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> when you submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the first thing that happens is a thorough disruption of life as you have defined it your way. Did you hear what I said? A thorough disruption of life as you have defined or arranged it your way. When God comes into your life, he does not continue with your life the way you designed it. There is a disruption of that plan. It's the reason why many people cannot submit to the Spirit of God. Because you have pledged loyalty to God by his Spirit. I will go, I will go, wherever you lead me, I will go. I will go, I will go, wherever you lead me, I This is the reason why God likes songs of surrender, because he will answer them quickly. You know all these songs we sing, God take everything. Say, aha, uh -huh, this is what I've been waiting for. But you see, because the spirit of God is not a demon spirit, at every point in his leadership journey with you, he will have to verify that you are still willing to trust him. Did you hear what I said? He will not usurp it over you. No. I'm willing to guide you. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. They are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit is based on the understanding that God's ways are not your ways. Neither his thoughts your thoughts. Are we together? That you can want life your way. Ah, but if you can trust God. Let me tell you the truth. The initial point of your journey with the Holy Spirit will be rough. And it is not rough because that's how he leads. It is rough because of the bad plans you have made for yourself. That in your own wisdom you believe you have designed an excellent life. Here he comes. Spirit of the living God. Ah. I love the Holy Spirit too. 
when he steps into your life you who is thinking politics politics me i know i'll win the election he just comes upon you and gently he starts doing a u-turn and for some people it's 180 degrees are we together let me tell you what it means to submit to the holy spirit to submit your will to submit your plans to submit your ways and to be willing to receive from him even if it is inconveniencing you you trust the fact that he represents he is the spirit of the father and that he has your best interest it may not make sense but somewhere along the journey after 10 years you will see the wisdom of his leadership someone please listen to me because one of the ways carnal people get into trouble is judging 10 years using the myopic lens of today God can look at you and tell you join this chariot it may not make sense till after 11 years you will see why he brought you to that relationship you will see why he brought you to koinonia the version of you that came may not make sense God what are you doing with me and he says you just be consistent when he calls you to enter the ark it's because the rain is coming and just because the rain did not come for 120 years be patient when the rain comes you will see the value of that wisdom are we together yes. is the reason why the greatest way satan deceives believers is to act as the holy spirit because he knows that believers have opened up themselves to be yielded that is another discussion satan hardly attacks believers as satan he comes with the disguise of the holy spirit because he knows if he comes as satan you will cast him so he will come as an angel of light and suggest things using scripture but you need a level of maturity to say no even though this sounds good this is not the holy spirit god does not lead this way this is why you have to know the holy spirit before you submit to him if you submit to any voice and any entity that is not just human you will find out you have been submitting to many entities and many believers they think it's the holy spirit leading them they would die believing it's the holy spirit leading them but upon the lens of a spiritually matured person you will see the gaps that this level of submission is to a demon spirit not the holy spirit listen carefully this is a deliverance service for someone now there are people who have done stupid things in the name of being led by the spirit i will be showing you another element of being spiritual because if the only thing you do to be spiritual is submission to spirits you are in trouble I told you if Satan uses evil to destroy you and you resist it, he will use good. The most important thing is he wants you to be destroyed. So we have, respectfully speaking, we have an army of sincere people in the body of Christ doing all kinds of things. And the basis of their confidence, they will tell you, see my notebook, see it. God told me, I know what I saw. You are right. But we need to judge the kind of influence and there is a way to judge spirits this is why the bible says strong meat let me leave that one we're coming there you see that you can judge spirits if you are open-hearted tonight for someone it can be a deliverance service now to ask yourself this journey i'm taking i don't see the light and i'm not i'm seeing everything around it is taking me backward i'm going into a pit is this really the voice of god and when you check you will find out that you are being led by a demon spirit and you do not know if jesus had to pray for peter and say satan desired did he come like a, a beast with horns you think peter would not have resisted him he slipped into peter and used peter's compassion there are people who have left their place of glory and their place of assignment because they had a voice and the voice spoke beautifully the voice came through a dream and said go to this place the voice came and turned their destiny helpers to look like demons and they got off from that dream hating the people who will bless them listen carefully oh this message is to bless you we're talking about the spiritual man that a spiritual man in addition to an encounter with the person and the ministry of the holy spirit must submit 
to the Lordship of the Spirit. Let me tell you one classic sign to know that is the Holy Spirit leading you. There is nothing He will ever tell you that will be by force. No. You will be constrained, but the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God will always respect the will factor. The greatest gift God gave man is salvation through Christ. And even that, He never forced it on any man. Anything that demands that you do it by force is not the Spirit of God. It is inconsistent with the nature of love. I said before you life and death. I said before you blessing and cursing. I can only advise you, choose life. That's why the Holy Spirit is called a counselor. Are we listening now? Now, with all due respect, I know that I've read many books books I'm, I'm, I'm one person who has had a rich heritage of a journey with the Holy Spirit by the grace of God and I've read books on revivals and I've seen in many writings where people say things like the Holy Spirit told them if you don't do this you would die and I respect their level of revelation but I can tell you by the authority of scripture it's not accurate God does not work like that if God did not force you to receive him the moment God puts pressure on you and takes away the will factor, it's no longer called obedience, it's called oppression. The basis of obedience is that your power to choose must remain. You cannot tell me to obey until you give me an option to disobey. That's why there were two trees in the Garden of Eden, not one tree. Is someone learning now? This is one of the ways you judge spirits. And also, this is also one of the ways you judge prophecies. Anything that has to constrain you by force, something is wrong. No. 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 Give by force. Go there by force. Uh-uh. That language of force is not a kingdom language. Not towards the saints. Towards demon spirits, yes sir. But not the saints. Is someone learning already? Not by force. So by the time somebody says, it's not that, me too, it's not like I, God just forced me. Be careful. You are not bad, but just accept that you are still growing. When you grow, you will find out you have been blaming God. It's a lie. It's not God. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. God constrains. He puts pressure within your heart, either to go or to stay. But he will always leave the will factor. You can choose. I can choose as an act of my will today as a man of God and stand before you and stand before the whole world and say, you know what? I'm not interested in God again. It's an act of my will. You intercede for me, but at the end of it, when you intercede for me, let me tell you what happens. The Spirit of God will keep revealing to me the excellency of staying with him and the disaster that may happen to those he has connected to my grace. But at the end of it, when he finds out I have made up my mind, he will honor my decision and raise another person. That's how God works. Are you learning the ways of God? Because there are many believers who do not submit to the Spirit of God. And the reason why they do not submit to the Spirit of God is that they are afraid. Here's what they are afraid of. I have arranged my life my own way. I have planned everything. From graduation is America. And when you are praying, what you are saying is, God, you better make America work. Every time you pray that prayer, something in you and you say, I won't pray again. Because you are suspecting that if you actually submit to the Spirit of God, let me teach you something. If you run life by your understanding, you will make many mistakes. If you run life, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3 from verse 5 to 7, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And he says to lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, verse 6, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Someone say, direct me. Shout and say, guide me, O oh God. Ladies and gentlemen, the bit that God has done in this ministry today is from the foolishness of the guidance of the Spirit. There is nowhere written in the Bible that Koinonia will move from Zaria to Abuja. 
There is nowhere written in the Bible that koinonia will be all over the globe. It's not written directly there. There is a mandate to reach the ends of the earth. But that bespoke direction plus the season, that's the Holy Spirit for you. If you do not submit to the Holy Spirit, it will be like a man driving a beautiful car but not holding the steering. And this steering of destiny is too complicated for you to hold it. You are too small. Your hand is too small. You will not even be able to turn it. And when you insist that I will hold it and run my life my own way, very soon you see another hand bigger than your own running you to a ditch. That's Satan for you. Are we together? Let me tell you the truth. Allow God lead you by his spirit. Trust his leadership. You submit to the Holy Spirit the same way you gave your life to Christ. That from this day, Spirit of the living God, I trust you as the Spirit of the Father and I submit to your leadership. I submit to your leadership to guide me, to speak to me, to help me. I am unable to make destiny work my own way. I've tried and tried and it does not work. You are the spirit that guided Jesus to completion of his assignment. Even Jesus himself needed to be guided by that same spirit. The spirit of God is an ancient spirit. He has worked with many men. You are not the first. When you invite him into your life, don't you think the Holy Spirit just comes uninvited and says, hold my hands, Jared. No, it doesn't work that way. That's a demon spirit. Even if it's after 10 years, he will stretch his hands and say, give me a chance to produce the glory of God out of your life. And you will argue and say, I don't, I, I, I want to do things my own way. After you go around and waste time and waste destiny, you still come back to the same point and you will see the loving spirit say, I can make this journey easier for you. For someone tonight, you came to church and God is telling you this carnal approach to life using guesswork. Are we together? Oh, this one, this one. Abuja, Lagos, Abuja, Lagos. Let me count five. One, two, three, four, five. It's Lagos. You will ruin your life that way. This kind of superstitious living, you cannot risk your life and the destinies of people just using intelligence. What if you know better and you find out you made a mistake? No. The Holy Spirit for you. Hmm. When He holds you, you will start one journey after another. It will not make sense. So when he starts, remember I told you, he would disrupt a lot of your plans. You will not even understand your own life yourself. The only thing is that you know he's leading me. But as he leads you, through all of that darkness, all of a sudden you will start seeing a ray of light. And that light... And through the foolishness of your submitting to him, it may take a few years, but you now begin to see the beauty and glory that comes out of your life. And people will turn and say, I used to know this sister. My God, we thought this sister was a total failure. Look what God has done. Look what God has made out of his life, out of her life. Let me speak to someone here before I continue. You have run your life your own way. Listen, you came to church because God is telling you this is the stubbornness that got your grandfather where he was. God gave him a chance, he rejected it. For some of us, God came to our parents and said, can I help you? You don't know the road. There used to be an old hymn we used to sing in a seminary. My God knows the way through the wilderness. He says, all I have to do is to follow. That you hold his hands and say, Spirit of God, the world is too wicked, too complicated, too deceptive. I don't even know who is sincere and who is not, but I can trust you. I can trust you. What's that song? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct and he shall direct your heart trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding 
in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct and he shall direct your life. honestly i want you to believe that the holy spirit is a master at navigating destiny he knows the mountains he knows the valleys you see because in this journey of destiny you can be looking at a hole and not know it is a hole it's only when your eyes tells you it's a hole and you will see beautiful lush gardens and quickly get there and find yourself in a hole that if you are not careful you may never come out of there are many people who have entered pits in destiny pits in ministry pits in family only God can bring them out because they have decided that they will stubbornly run their lives by themselves God is speaking to someone trust God with your life you have trusted people and things of lesser value you carried your whole life and gave them help me you are the mighty God and you Told you, you are the glorious God. to you. Dave, can you sing for me that song, Spirit Lead Me? Find a convenient key and sing it. I want Spirit you to listen. Lead me where my trust is without borders. Listen. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet would ever spiritual man is beyond a church goer the spiritual man is beyond a tongue talker the spiritual man is beyond a routine prayer practitioner a spiritual man is beyond a fasting person now at the core of the journey to true spirituality it's number one, a genuine encounter with the Son of the Living God. Number two, an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number three, a thorough comprehension of the ways of God, the mysteries of the kingdom, the principles of the kingdom, and that by the scripture. Number four, listen carefully, submission submission is different from encounter there are many people who can write books about the holy spirit but it is clear from their lives that they do not want the inconvenience of submission
to the governing authority of the Spirit of God as an act of faith, as an act of trust. Number five, the fifth factor that defines spirituality, write this down please, is submission to transformation by the Word of God. Again, just like submission to the Holy Spirit, just because you have access to the mysteries of the kingdom, that is knowledge. It does not mean you have chosen to submit to transformation. Number five is one of the cardinal pillars that transits a man from carnality to spirituality. A carnal man is a carnal man because he is carnally minded. A spiritual man is a spiritual man because he is spiritually minded. Any other factor that holds minus mentality cannot leave someone a spiritual person. There are many people bragging about spirituality, but from the lens of scripture I submit to you, they are not spiritual men. No. Transformation. Submit to transformation. This is the fifth you are willing to submit to transformation by the word of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech thee, brethren, by the message of God, that ye offer, present your bodies unto God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Verse 2. It says, and be not conformed to this world. The thinking pattern that comes with this system, he says, but be ye transformed. Here it is by the renewal of your mind, that by your transformation you can prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Permit, allow, do not restrict, do not restrain this mentality from being in you which was also in Christ Jesus. True spirituality is not just about activities. True spirituality is seen in the extent of your submission for transformation to a point where you are changed in experience. There are many people who pray but have refused to change. Did you hear what I said? Because prayer is supposed to lead to change but they have refused to change. Many people study the scripture and quote scripture, but they have not submitted to transformation. Many people fast and keep fasting, but they have not submitted to transformation. Many people come to church, they can quote everything they have learned from everywhere, but they have not submitted to change. Can I tell you, you cannot be a, spiritually, a, a spiritual man with a carnal mind. It doesn't work that way. It is that transition from carnal thinking to true spirituality. And the Bible says the reward you get is life and peace. Submission to the word of God. Submission to transformation. That the word of God, like the spirit of God, becomes final authority over your life. You have been indoctrinated by the value system of the kingdom. Are we together? I have taught you that one of the ways you test transformation is that it becomes difficult for people to connect you to any region within the earth. It's difficult for them to say you are Yoruba or Hausa or Igbo, maybe by your accent or by your look, that's fine. But by behavior, no. Your behavior is so transitioned, it betrays where you are coming from. You can't see someone and say, you are behaving like them. Where are you from? Uh -huh. It's all these people. That's how they behave. No, that means you've not grown. Because the kingdom of God has its culture too. And when you submit to the word of God, something begins to happen to you. You see that? He won't stop. He won't stop. Till my life looks like him He won't stop He won't stop Till my mind looks like him He won't stop He won't stop Till my destiny looks like him See, 
when you know this you will not only get born again and keep bragging i've been a christian for 10 years and make a mockery of your christian experience the next thing to ask yourself is whose mindset am i representing whose mindset have i embraced stumbling blocks that will not allow you to be a representation of the image of christ in experience Are we together? Submission to transformation. This is what is happening to you. That's why I salute you and I take your coming every week. Not just as a, I don't have a membership mentality as a man of God. I'm too serious to be thinking membership. No. You are beyond members. This is God's, God's vessel, God's ship on a project towards transformation is the reason why I take my work very seriously you see that because every time we have the opportunity to meet whether to meet virtually or to meet here is the business of transformation I know that if you are not transformed the reality of the Christ life will not be manifest in you and this is what has plagued many people some of you are here and you are wondering why the promises of God cannot find expression. There is a kind of believer that can capture the promises of God in your life in experience. And if you don't transition, do you know, for instance, and I will wrap up with that. The believer who cannot give up anger, look up please, anger alone. Just let's use one fleshly attribute of anger that you cannot die to anger by the spirit anger alone can wreck all your relationships and destroy your destiny forever are we together how about lost not just lost in terms of immoral behavior lost for things money it can relocate you out of the will of god send wrong people to your life you see that now i hope you are listening to what i'm telling you just one fleshly attribute is like a virus that can enter your system and wreck you into pieces wreck you into pieces i love god oh but let me tell you me my own kind of pastor is when i'm angry i will come down to the member and beat the person and come up you see don't celebrate bad things change whether you're a man of God, whether you're a member, if you find out something in you is not good, don't justify it. Because a man of God is still a student. Change! Don't justify it. I won't go back, can't go back to the way it used to be. Before your presence came and changed me I will go back, can go back To the way it used to be Before your presence came and changed me Hallelujah I want you to know that if you refuse to transit to become spiritual at the end of your life your Christian testimony will never inspire anybody to love God because all that your life will capture is a plethora of events that will cause you pain misrepresent Christ and perhaps cut short your life you will never see the reality of the victorious life at work. And you will be wondering why. God will push you to destiny help us, but anger will drive you away from them. Demon spirits will come to oppress you, but because you have not submitted to that which builds your discernment, you will fall cheaply into all kinds of things. You see, the reason why we pray, the reason why we fast, the reason why we study the word, the reason why we submit ourselves to all the spiritual disciplines is to this end. It is not to show religiosity. It is as part of the tools that sponsor that transition 
to become spiritual. The justification for prayer huh, is not just doing it in the presence of people. It's the change that happens as proof that it has changed you. The justification for studying scripture is not just to quote it in the presence of people. That can be pretense. Is that you have been so immersed by that word, you have become one with it. So it's not just something you preach. It's not even what you do again. It is who you are. Just like God, you have become an expression of the logos of God in experience. That when men look at you, the next person they think about is Jesus Christ. And it's not because you are holding a Bible. It's not because you are standing on stage. It is because you have become one with the word. One with the spirit. Through the vehicle of prayer. Through the vehicle of fasting. Through the vehicle of listening to the word of God. Most believers don't know why they pray. Let me tell you the truth. A major part of believers in Africa pray because of guilt. Not because they want to grow. They just pray because it seems like they don't want to be blackmailed. That they are not spiritual by not being prayerful. And so people just do it as a ritual. And you will see a lot of energy dissipated in prayer. But the transformation it should capture is not captured in the life of the people. A lot of believers study scripture simply, especially men of God. We like to study scripture simply because we want to have the, go through the rhetorics of intelligence. But the transformation that comes by submitting to the word is largely deficient in our lives. The spiritual man, hear me, is not just one who is out of the spirit, interacting with spirits, because occultists do that. The spiritual man is one who in order of priority has encountered Christ. The spiritual man has encountered the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, has access to the mysteries of the kingdom, and then has chosen as an act of his or her will to submit to the governing authority of the Spirit of God to guide you in all matters. And you have chosen to submit to transformation that the Word of God becomes the vista with which I look at life. Are we together? Are you learning? Now, let me teach you something as we find a place to pray. Hmm. Someone is rising in this place tonight. And by the spirit of the living God, you are stepping into a dimension in the spirit where your life becomes a sign and a wonder. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, listen. The Bible talks about attaining unto the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, please. Give us from verse 10. The Bible says, He that descended is also the same that ascended far above the heavens, that he may feel all things. Verse 11. It says, And he gave unto some. Please pay attention now. You need to get what I'm about to show you. He gave unto some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Verse 12. Why did he give that? For the perfecting. The word perfecting means the maturing of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying, listen, of the body of Christ. And here is the standard that God has for every believer. Verse 13. It says, till we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, mature, entire man. Then he says, unto the measure of the stature, help me please, of the fullness of Christ. That is, that is God's destiny as far as the making of the believer is concerned. That you can get to a point in the spirit where you can attain the fullness of Christ and manifest that. I've studied this for a while because in my mind I'm just wondering and saying how does a man become a reflection of the Christ in his fullness? Is that even possible? Can a man actually be a reflection of the fullness of Christ? I found out it is true. 
And I want to show you how right now. And then we'll pray. That a man can attain unto a state of maturity where your life becomes a wholesome reflection of Christ in his fullness to your world, to the earth. Now, in learning Jesus Christ and in reflecting him, please, I want you to listen. And if you're a man of God here, I want you to listen. If you are training people to become like Christ, these are the areas you must focus on. If these areas are not captured in your training, the people you are leading will never become like Christ. It doesn't matter what kind of spiritual activities you engage in. The formation of Christ in the saints has a formula. Are we together? There is something you have to guide the people into understanding, receiving, submitting to. And you will find out, not just one, two, three people, en masse, you will find out that ordinary people, weak people, sinners as we call them, will suddenly begin to transition in the spirit until you have the privilege of leading people who are truly like Christ. Can I show you this? Number one, the first area, the first area you must focus on, building in your attempt to build in people, the image, the character, the formation of Christ, the first area you have to focus on to mold in them is the nature of Christ. The first dimension of the fullness of Christ that must be captured and reflected in people is the nature of Christ. The nature of Christ. The nature of Christ. The people you are leading are not becoming like Jesus if his nature is not manifesting and if his nature is not reflecting in them. Notice the progression. The primary assignment of any man of God in an attempt to build a people who are a reflection of Christ, in an attempt to build true spiritual people, is to partner with the Word and the Holy Spirit to see to it that the nature of the Christ is formed in them. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. Now, what you know and you call the fruit of the Spirit. Now, when you read KJV, follow carefully. KJV makes it look like there are nine fruits. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering. And there's nothing wrong if you see it that way. But classically speaking, the fruit of the Spirit, you notice it's not said fruits. It is one fruit. The epitome of the manifestation of the Christ is love. The nature of God at work in a man is the love nature. But that this nature expresses itself in all of these varieties. Joy, an expression of love. Peace, an expression of love. Patience, an expression of love. Gentleness. Gentleness is not a personality thing. It is the outworking of the spirit of the Christ in a yielded vessel. Listen, as you are looking at these things now, debunk respectfully from the lens of scripture that thought that this is my personality. I am an angry person. I am not, gel I'm not um, gentle. I am jealous. That's how we are. It's a lie. When you become a spiritual man, it is the journey to deadening every other thing that is not of the Christ. Are we together now? The nature of Christ. Everybody say the nature of Christ. That means I should be able to bring someone, Igbo, Yoruba, Hausa, South South, Middle Belt, Caribbean, American, European, group all of them together. If it is true they are spiritual men, they should look like relatives from the same family. Are we together? That you should have reduced like a viral load to its barest minimum the character of the flesh. When you look at them, please keep that scripture. This is what I should find in a spiritual man. Love. In all its expressions. Joy. You see that? Peace. Patience. I'm not a patient person, but I love God. Work on it. Work on it. Allow the spirit of God. Live out the character of the Christ. All of these things, we saw it in the life of Jesus. And the Bible says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. We always think of this in, with respect to power. But power issue will come. 
But the first area that you must labor with the Spirit to build is the character and the nature of Christ. Say it again, the nature of Christ. Gentleness, goodness, faith. Uh -huh. Verse 23. Meekness. You know what meekness is? Teachability. Teachability. The antidote to pride. Teachability. Temperance. Another word for temperance is self-control. 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 It says against such there is no law. Listen to me. When you look at a Christian, a child of God, who has truly become a spiritual man, the first thing that should catch your attention is not tongues. The first thing that should catch your attention is not rema. The first thing that should catch your attention, listen carefully, is not manifestations of power. The first thing that should catch your attention when you meet a real Christian is the energy that flows from his love life. Did you hear what I said? You see that we have a lot of work to do in our lives. How many of us say we are Christians and people stand and they want to run away because hate has an energy. You can feel it. We vent our anger in our sermons. We vent our anger as we deal with people in our offices and we wrap up everything in the name of the Lord. No, sir. No, sir. The real proof that you are becoming a spiritual man, I am telling you this, with no excuses whatsoever, is that the love of Christ is growing within you. We say that after every service, and yet we do not believe it. Here's what we say. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the, we even say the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Huh? Be with us all. Amen. Love. Love for God and love for people. Everybody say love. love. The, I'm saying this to you so that you will check your life right now. You came to church. And if you find out that the love of God is not growing. And if it's only God you love, you are lying. I hope you know that. Because the nature of God's love is both vertical and horizontal. If your love is only to God. <clears throat> the more you love him the more you love those he died for. The more you love him, the more you love those he's trusting you with. You see, as a man of God, for instance, when you love the people God has sent to you, you don't need to be preached into not manipulating them. All of these things we try to address in the body of Christ, the real problem is that people do not love God and they do not love the people that God has sent to them. Because there are many, many things that live your life when love is there. Are we together? When you love God and you love the people he has sent to you, you will love them too much to deceive them. You will love them too much to manipulate them. You will love them too much to try and turn their minds for your own personal gain. No, this is beyond an issue of conscience. This is as a testament that the nature of God dwells in you. How many believers have love? When you begin to make teachings on love, most believers just think it's a feminine thing. Their mind goes straight to Valentine. And they think love, love. Is it really this love thing? I want miracle and power. Is the reason why many people become cheated. Because love is not as weak as you think it is. That's what defeated Satan. People come to church and just for three hours, they cannot tolerate the people sitting by their left and right. Three hours. Because hatred in them is boiling like water at 100 degrees, waiting for who to pour on. Sit down. The next time you push me, I will slap you, even though we're in church. Let me just tell you, I'm not like that. If you are tired of me, go and look for another neighbor. Lift up your hand, Jesus, I love you. And God is saying, who are you deceiving? I hope you are learning. Love. The real missing ingredient. 
because our world does not know the value of love love is not a feminine thing it's not just some weak emotional thing it is the very manifestation of the nature of God let me tell you it is beautiful to see a believer that really truly has the love of Christ there are things you will not do to your neighbor if you have love you will not rejoice I don't want to take you to 1 Corinthians 13 and show you what the Bible says about love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and I have not love. Is that in your Bible? Though I offer my body to be born, say sacrifice. Uh -huh. Many people have the power and the energy for sacrifice, but the love component is not there. It says, though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries. I've not met such a man. And though I have all knowledge and I have all faith to move mountains and I have not love, I am nothing. Verse 3, it says, Though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, say charity, and I give my body to be born, matayadom, and I do not have love, it does not profit me anything. Then it says, love is patience. I wish we have new King James. Love is patient. Thank you. Suffers long it is kind it does not envy are you seeing now so don't say i have love check whether you have envy if envy is there envy push part of love out to be there does not parade itself is not puffed up verse 5 does not behave rudely does not seek its own self is not easily provoked or provoked thinketh no evil you see that love is also a mentality issue Verse 6, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 7, bears all things, believes all things. It doesn't mean believe nonsense, whatever they bring. I hope you understand that now. Hopes all things, endures all things. This is the character of love. When the love of God is at work in your life and you're a true Christian, the first thing unbelievers want to see is not power. The first thing unbelievers want to see is love. Let me tell you the truth. I have studied church growth and I want to tell you something. This is not a pastor's conference. I don't know why God is going this way this night. But let me tell you one real secret to church growth. Love. You will not hear this taught in Bible in pastor's conferences. Rather, people can say, you know what, do this. Some of the biggest churches today in the world, with all due respect, are not necessarily power churches. He said John did no miracles, but there was one testimony he had. He was an honest man. He had love within his heart. I've seen people who are very powerful and wonder why nobody wants to listen to them. Because human beings are not only looking for power. We have made power look like it is everything. No. There is a place for that as you'll be learning. But the first manifestation of the Christ-like dimension in a man is his nature. Never forget this. Before you seek power, seek to be like Christ by having his love and his character at work in you. Then your being powerful will be valuable. But it is a dangerous thing to pursue power without the nature of God first. And leaders, when you are mentoring your people, don't be in a hurry to just lay hands and impart people. No, build the nature of Christ in them first. An anointed preacher who does not have the character of Christ is a dangerous person. I tell you this. It's the reason why there's a lot of misbehavior with the anointing. If I'm angry, I can speak a curse on you anyhow. That is not a power problem. It is a nature of God problem. One time the disciples saw some people and said, should we call down fire? Like Elijah, this, ah. Jesus looked at them and said, do you not know of whom you are of? No, this is another kind of spirit at work in you. Place your hand on your chest and pray in one minute. I desire to have the love nature of Christ. Please pray sincerely from your heart. When the love of God is at work in you, you do not rejoice over the hurt and the pain of others. The body of Christ needs to grow out of this. We rejoice over the hurt and the pain of others. No. The Christ-like formation starts with his love. The love of Jesus. 
that you hear that someone lost a job in your office you are not rejoicing and saying confirmation of prophecy i saw it no you go back and you say how how will this man now it is love that should lead us to prayer it is love that should lead us to bible study it is love that should lead us to fasting any other thing that leads you aside from love is not of faith and it is sin love must be the reason why i desire growth in my life and in this ministry if love is not there the alternative will be competition the alternative will be envy the alternative will be jealousy the alternative will be vain glory love is a purifier it purifies motives number two The first dimension of Christ that must be captured in any man to be spiritual is called his nature, the nature of Christ. Number two, the second dimension of Christ that must be captured in every believer to be called a spiritual man is called the mind or the wisdom of Christ. So the first is the nature of Christ, the love of Christ. The second dimension is called the mind of of Christ Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 the mind of Christ the mind of Christ the mind of Christ the wisdom in fact I think it's um is it first Corinthians 2 7 or so I hope I got that right give it to us let's see first Corinthians chapter 2 and 7 yes the wisdom the hidden wisdom that God ordained for our glory I used to think when the Bible says the mind of Christ, it just means the brain of Christ. But the mind, the word mind of Christ there does not just mean the mentality of Christ. It's an overall capture of the wisdom of God. One of the ways you manifest Christ is in wisdom. There is something in the Bible called the wisdom of the just. Luke 1 17, the wisdom of the just. Anybody who is in Christ, there is a dimension of wisdom. It's called the mind of Christ. Transformation, but a manifestation of wisdom. If that wisdom is not captured in your life, you are not a spiritual man. It's like a general that does not know how to shoot a gun. Is that a real general? How did he become a general? Even a young boy graduated from NDA who cannot shoot a gun will not graduate. Are we together? A general that cannot shoot a gun a football superstar who has never scored when one penalty kick a policeman who has never made one arrest no there is a wisdom component that is required in life are we together yeah. listen when you believe this you will cry out for the nature of Christ to be more like him but then in addition to being like him you have to justify his nature by supplying to your world a dimension of wisdom they know can only be found in Christ are you seeing it now the first place it affects is your heart huh then it goes to your mind are you seeing that now then it goes to your hands power your heart purified you become like Christ in experience. I shared with you here humorously a story many years ago, went to look for instruments from a man of God. And after the man was done preaching, preached powerfully, when we met the man, he lambasted and insulted us, used words that even a baby Christian should not use. And at the end of it, I remember, it's very, very young boys were on our way going back, and I was thinking to myself, what kind of a preacher is this? I'm comparing in my mind two people. One person who minutes ago was standing and shouting and the other person who stood and was insulting us and calling anything he can remember. And I'm saying, no, this, is, this ought not to be so. The nature of Christ and then the wisdom, the wisdom of God. I'm praying for you in the name of Jesus Christ that the dimension of wisdom that will begin to flow from your life today, it will cause everybody to love God because of you. Yeah. That the wisdom 
that you will begin to command, it will produce extraordinary results from your life. You will gain mastery over the mysteries of the kingdom and you will engage them with such level of mastery. Your life will be an unending episode of kingdom exploits. You believe that? Say amen. amen. It takes wisdom to build and excel in ministry. It takes wisdom to build and excel in career. It takes wisdom to maintain relationships. It takes wisdom to frontier and champion kingdom activities. Behind the mighty works you see that the saints command is the wisdom of God. Ordinary men fortified by divine wisdom. Wisdom that is not Sophia, not just earthly wisdom. Wisdom that is not just sensual and scientific. Wisdom that is not just demonic or diabolic. Wisdom that comes from above. Pure, potent, carrying the ability to, to, to deliver results. Be tired of your non-productive nature as a believer and begin to contend for wisdom. Something is wrong with my life. I love the Lord. Let people not look at your life and say, this man, oh, if he's been a Christian, he loves being a, he's a child of God. But in terms of kingdom results, don't, call, don't go to him. He has 100% love and zero wisdom. Bad decisions. Wisdom. The wisdom of the just. There is a kind of education believers must have. Your secular education, as powerful as it is, is wonderful, needed, useful, but not enough to produce the kind of godlike destiny you seek to produce. Do you know why? The variables that you need to overcome to be successful God's way are so many, and not all of them are captured in your secular training. You have to be re enlightened, re educated again God's way to equip you with the requisite wisdom. To reign as a king and as a priest that you are. Hallelujah. Everybody say wisdom. And wisdom is not just a spiritual thing alone. Wisdom affects your mind. The way you think. The way, there is a way you can do the business God has given you. You will see the... Re Let me tell you this. How do you know God's wisdom is at work? Because you will see God's dimension of results through your decisions. The moment your decisions are still producing human results, you have not brought God's wisdom. I tell you. Extraordinary, undeniable works by the hand of God. That is wisdom for you. Wisdom in ministry. Wisdom in business. Wisdom in your marriage. Wisdom in how you are raising your children. Wisdom in how you are dealing with your finances. Wisdom in leadership. How you are raising the people you are raising. You see that now? Something happens to a people when they become wise unto godliness. Not earth wisdom. Not smartness. Not wisdom that manipulates someone, cough out 2,000 and you say you are smart. No, that is demonic, diabolic wisdom. There is a wisdom that puts you in a class. A class that it will be clear that is God that kept you here. My God, I have seen careers of this wisdom in my life. I've had the honor to meet a few of them. And when I do, for the times that I have, I cry for an impartation of that wisdom. The wisdom that comes from above. There is the gift of wisdom. There is the spirit of wisdom. You will never be able to do any work of the kingdom and excel except you have wisdom. So number one, the nature of God. Number two, the mind of Christ. Are you ready for number three? I will give you this and then we'll pray to end the service tonight. The spiritual man. The third dimension of the reflection of Christ that must be captured in the believer is called the works of Christ. So here we have the nature or character of Christ. Number two, we have the mind slash wisdom of Christ. And then the final phase are the works of Christ. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, with power, with power. When it has to do with the works, you see power has been introduced now. Power. 
who went about doing good. He didn't say who went about organizing programs. He went about doing good as a lifestyle, the works of Christ, doing good. This is beyond just charity. Doing good, bringing life, becoming like a river that everywhere you flow to, life happens for the people. Healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Notice three words that you should not forget when it has to do with the works of Christ. The Holy Spirit, power, Satan. The Holy Spirit who brings the power and that power is primarily against the demonic activities that assault the saints. The works of Christ. In John chapter 20 and verse 21. John chapter 20 and verse 21. Please give it to us. John 20 and verse 21. Do we have that? John 20 and verse 21. So Jesus said unto them again, Peace to you as the Father has sent me, my God. As the Father has sent me, he did not just send me to reveal his nature. He sent me to reveal his power. When Jesus went to the temple to read the messianic prophecy, he opened it and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach glad tidings to the poor or the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. You are wondering what the works of Christ are? This, I'm listening it for you. To bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are oppressed, the works of Christ. If you want to be a reflection of the Christ as a spiritual man, you have the character of Christ, the wisdom of Christ, but you need the works of Christ. And this is where the value of the anointing comes. When the sick are healed supernaturally, to the glory of God, that's the works of Christ. When you reach down to the poor and the needy and by helping them to supply help and aid and then teaching them the principles that empower them, that is the works of Christ. When you become light upon the earth, salt upon the earth, light, you see that? The works of Christ. There are many believers who do not want to contend for this dimension of power to do the works of Christ. It is the nature of Christ plus the wisdom of Christ plus the works of Christ that represents the fullness of Christ at work in a believer. Let me take that again. The nature or the character of Christ plus the wisdom, the mind of Christ plus the works of Christ, extraordinary exploits by the Spirit and through the Word when these three dimensions are captured in your life, you are truly a spiritual man. A spiritual man, therefore, is not just a man who loves to study the Bible. It's not just a man who loves to pray. It's not just a man who loves to go to church. It's not just a man who wants to serve God in ministry. A spiritual man, you can safely summarize it as one who has worked with the Spirit of God to be able to embrace and inculcate within himself in experience the nature of Christ who is manifesting by submission to the word you see that the wisdom of Christ and who by the spirit of grace is demonstrating and manifesting the works of Christ the chiefest of them being the work of global evangelization bringing many to Christ because according to scripture God desires that all men be saved and then to come unto the knowledge of the son tonight there are three categories of people in this place number one those who have never been saved unregenerate they have not met Jesus they've been at crusades 
They've been at churches. They have Christian names, born from Christian families, related to men and women of God, but they have never made this decision for Jesus. Number two, there are believers who are barely saved and have remained without an intention to grow using the parameters that I've given you. They are just out of that list that I gave you for a spiritual man. It is only one over five they have. Their only justification is that they, have, they are saved. But they have not submitted. They have not encountered the person of the Holy Spirit. Nor are they interested. They have not encountered the, the logos of God. The thoughts of God. And they are not willing to submit to the Spirit of God. They are not willing to submit to transformation by the Word of God. And then we have this third category. And there is no graduation in this third category. You never get to a point where you say, I am done becoming a spiritual man. No. It is a bar measured upon a bar measured. By the time you cover grounds in spirituality, God opens up another layer. And you see that there is still more of his nature that needs to be formed. There is still more of his wisdom that needs to manifest through you. There is still more of his power that needs to be revealed. By the time you cover grounds, after 10 years, he commends you. And then he gives you a greater charge to become like him in a greater way. Let me tell you the truth. For anyone, including you, including me, who will contend by the spirit that from today, I will see to it that I will take advantage of the life of God that I already have and allow the spirit of God, the word of God, through all the activities of prayer, fasting, the word study, engaging in mentorship, that I will allow by the Spirit the full formation of the nature of God in my life. That love nature reflected in the fruit of the Spirit. And then the wisdom of God, the mind of Christ, a superior transformed mentality, a God-like mentality producing God-like dimensions of results. And then for the power of God, that for as long as I'm alive, through my words, through my hands, many will see Christ at work, a display of his power, dumbfounding principalities and powers, that under my watch, there will be no untimely death in my family again. That under my watch, it will never be that people are desirous of a job or whatever to do. No, you come there as the manifestation of the Christ. So you don't just say things you cannot defend. You can gather your family and tell them, I found a way. This family can become a great reflection of Christ. And they say, how? You will tell them, number one, the nature of Christ can superimpose all these demonic manifestations, these habits and challenges that misrepresent Christ. Number two, by transformation, the mind of Christ can find expression in and through our lives. Communicating the wisdom of God, commanding mighty works through it. And number three, by the supernatural engracing of the spirit, I can get to a point where I attain unto power, genuine spiritual power. I believe in the power of God, but I believe that in order of priority, the nature of God is greater than his power. It is true. If you are asked to choose between the power of God and the nature of God it is wise to choose the nature of God because it is impossible to truly have the nature of God and not eventually manifest his power are we together so if you've had it the other way around unfortunately you see all these three dimensions we have communicated part of them and we call our communications of part of them denominations they only represent our emphasis. So there are those who camp around the nature of Christ and that becomes their definition with all due respect of the fullness of Christ. That is inaccurate. There are those who don't care about the nature of Christ. They are especially the teaching ministry, the wisdom of Christ. And you find people manifesting dimensions of wisdom without the corresponding character. And then... We have another group that all there is is power and the charismatic gifts of the Spirit. It doesn't matter whether you are a criminal. 
it doesn't matter whether you are a devil once the gift of the spirit can flow that's not the way it's supposed to be this is the correct arrangement the nature of the Christ the mind the wisdom of the Christ the power of the Christ the works of Christ this is what represents the fullness of God's nature and this is what Paul was telling the church in Ephesus that it is to this end that God went through all that labor to give unto some apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers are we together and pastors why to be able to help the body of Christ manifest in its fullness the nature of Christ manifest the wisdom of Christ and manifest the power of Christ and let me tell you honestly before we round up you will seldom be given an assignment to complete or manifest all these three by yourself no usually there are portions of these dimensions given to us the whole job is supposed to do be done by a corporate body not only one person so if you have a rich understanding of the nature of Christ and you stop there, you will rob people from manifesting the wisdom of Christ and doing the works of Christ. You see that? That is the reason why it is a dangerous thing when the body of Christ fights itself. This is what we are fighting. The believer who only manifests the nature of Christ will never manifest the fullness of Christ. The believer who manifests only the wisdom of Christ will draw people to him. But lack of character, the nature of Christ, will even bring a bigger betrayal to the name of Christ. Because you will be like that tree. You attract people by your wisdom. But when they come, because you see proximity reveals. The moment you come close, you will see, ah, no now, not again. And if all you have is the power of God, the greatest misrepresentation of the Christ will come from manifesting his power without his wisdom and without his nature. That is dangerous. Because of these three, the, mo the one that has the most attraction is the power dimension. So it will bring multitudes and you'll find out you are bankrupt of wisdom but sadly bankrupt of his nature. So in mentoring believers, you don't start with power. You don't start with wisdom. Discipleship 101, the labor of building the character of Christ in people. Then the wisdom of Christ. Then the power of Christ. You have raised a mighty army for Jesus. Are you ready to pray? Please rise up on your feet. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to pray as we wrap up that even for people who God has helped to be spiritual there are various dimensions of these formations of Christ in us. There are people the richest dimension of the formation of Christ in you is his wisdom not his character. There are those the richest formation of the Christ in you. It's not like the nature is not there but it's not rich enough to bring glory to Christ. God is calling us tonight to adjust these various areas for the one who has the power of God more than character more than wisdom God is calling you to step up these two don't just perform miracles don't just prophesy there is room to know the word of God and have an understanding of scripture your antidote to error but more importantly the nature of Christ that the closer people come to you they will truly see that you are a representation of Christ imagine you having a rich manifestation of his nature and character in experience, having sound wisdom, understanding the ways of God, that the moment you open your mouth is wisdom that is communicated, and then having the faculty to defend the things that you propose through wisdom, that you have power, you are not deficient of spiritual power. That's going to be your prayer. Please open your mouth and pray. You know what area is deficient in your life, Take the next few minutes to cry before God. Lord, I'm praying, walk upon my character. Let the nation see you when they see me. Someone is praying. Online, make sure you are praying. 
I desire a richer manifestation of the nature of Christ. The attributes of the flesh that misrepresent God in my life. Someone is praying that they die and give room for the Christ to be seen. Pray for those who have done a good job allowing the fruit of the Spirit manifest. The fruit of the Spirit is important but you need in addition to it wisdom. Many people lack wisdom. They are born again. They are sincere Christians but they are poor. They are broke. They cannot build any organization. They cannot build any ministry. They can't build anything. They can't build their children. The problem is not lack of character. The problem is lack of wisdom. Anytime you do not have the power to build anything that lasts is a wisdom problem. Go ahead and pray. And there are those who have wisdom. When you listen to them, they say a lot of intelligent things, but there's no demonstration of the Spirit. We can talk about healing, but then the sick are never healed. Talk about liberty. We can teach intelligently about liberty. But the performance dimension of God is not there in their life. Please go ahead and pray. Oh, salvation has come. Oh, salvation has come. you pray 10 more seconds father your nature the character of the Christ pray against everything you know anger lust jealousy bitterness rage don't keep quiet everything that fights the nature of Christ should be your project in this prayer let it die let it die let it die in the name of Jesus that when men see me, the first thing they see is the nature and the character of Christ. Love, kindness, joy. Now pray for wisdom. That's the reason you are not able to build anything. Not your finances not your business not your ministry every time you cannot build is a wisdom problem it may not be a character problem a wisdom problem it is by wisdom a house is built it is by wisdom a destiny is built it's by wisdom a ministry is built every time you do not build to excel you do not build to last the wisdom of christ is deficient in you Someone is praying. Kapreke paratos kadish, lakrepeta kapreke tos kapreke parus. Hallelujah. Please go back and listen to this teaching again. That the signature attestations to your being a spiritual man 
is that you must reflect Christ in his fullness and that in reflecting Christ to his fullness there are three compartments his nature his character the fruit of the spirit the recreated human spirit who is yielded to the Holy Spirit will produce these fruits and then his wisdom the empowerment to build anything that brings glory to Christ sponsored by wisdom the quality of your decisions the superiority of your understanding the dexterity of your thinking wisdom and then the power of God the ability to demonstrate Christ here and now to bring heavenly reality to be made manifest supernaturally so it is impossible to walk these three things and not truly reflect Christ the fullness of Christ is not a mystery it is the nature of Christ at work in you plus the wisdom of the Christ the mind of Christ richly formed in you in ever increasing measure plus the power of God finding expression so the next time you go to the place of prayer and you say Lord I want to become like you you are now not praying a vague prayer you know what you are praying a greater formation of your nature a greater importation of your wisdom a greater manifestation of your power you see you are now praying profitably when you open your Bible and you are studying this is still what you are becoming the next time you say I want to become like Christ you can help correct someone's understanding so that that becoming like Christ does not become abstract to the average believer when they say I want to become like Christ they don't even have a picture I have given definition to that abstract concept it is the nature of the Christ the mind the wisdom of the Christ and the power of the Christ enabling you to do the works of Christ this is what is captured in the fullness of Christ for every conference you will attend for every church service for every message you will listen to for every prayer program every fasting program every word study program every book you will buy and read I want you to interpret everything from the lens of this journey this is your journey with the Spirit this is your journey with God lift your hands father I pray for your people in the name that is above all names the grace to allow that life of Christ that they received at the point of salvation the grace to allow this find expression I'm praying may that grace rest upon you Amen. number two for those who have manifested the nature of Christ in such a rich way but you've not been able to build anything in your life the matters that make for life you are defeated there completely defeated in your finances defeated in leadership you've not been able to raise anybody or do anything great for the kingdom I'm praying for you as you begin to journey through the world may authentic wisdom be imparted upon you Amen. number three I'm praying for those who are getting frustrated by saying the many things God can do as revealed by wisdom but not able to demonstrate it here and now in your life not the life of those who trust you I'm praying for you this missing power component that will help you do the works of Christ let it rest upon you now in the name of Jesus for everyone who is struggling with the flesh attributes of the flesh anger jealousy competition all the things that keep misrepresenting your knowing God I'm praying for you the spirit that is behind that programming I curse it right now I curse it right now in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus finally I pray for you the next time someone is looking to see who God is may God send you to them as a representation of the image of the Christ in the name of Jesus Christ thank you father thank you father please I want to encourage you 
go back home. Take this as an instruction. Listen to this message again. Don't assume you understood everything I said. Stay with the spirit of grace. Absorb it into your spirit. And you find someone who is confused about his spiritual journey. You don't have the time to explain all this. Just give the person this message. And say, listen to this message, the spiritual man. Be patient and follow through the thoughts. And then you will see that indeed becoming like Christ is not abstract. There is a guided pathway that can help men become like Christ. You are here and you need Jesus Christ. Please allow me to make the altar call while we're still standing. Remember I told you, the first transition from a natural man to a believer in fact, before we even talk about a spiritual man, is your encounter with Christ. Do not allow this meeting end without your making this decision. And for the sake of one or two persons that whilst you were listening to me, you said, Apostle, in truth, I have not made this decision. Or you are saying, I want to rededicate my life. I'm going to count one to five. And I'll need you to be fast on this because of our time. Pick your Bibles, your bags, everything you brought to church. Please be on your way as I begin to count. Come right in front of me. By now, you should know that you don't need cajoling. We are talking Jesus here and your destiny. I begin my counting now. One. Let's appreciate them as they come. God bless you. Your bags, your Bible. Please stand for sake of space. God bless you. Stand. Koinonia, let's celebrate them as they come. I won't go back. Can't go back to the way it used to be. Before your presence came and changed me. I won't go back. Can't go back to the way it used to be. Before your presence came Keep coming, one more time I won't go back Can't go back To the way it used to be Before your presence came and changed me If you're joining them, please come quickly. I'm about to lead them to pray. Thank you so much, my brothers and sisters all of you who have responded to this call and for the many who are responding to this call whether in your home you are following by television or internet as i lead god's people to make this prayer i want you to make that prayer to knowing that this becomes your point of transition from being a natural person and then you begin your journey to being a spiritual man spiritual woman in experience may i request that you lift your right hand if you can please high above your head say this after me as loud and as clear as you can say lord jesus i have heard your word i declare that i love you with all my heart i believe that you are the son of god i believe that you died for my sin i believe that you rose again for my justification right now i receive jesus into my heart as my savior my lord and my king i declare that from today i'm a child of god i go forward ever and backward never amen keep your beautiful hands lifted father thank you for these precious people you have brought them before you your word declares that as many who will come to you you will in no wise cast away lord we honor you for these many who have come to you and i pray that based on the authority of scripture that their sins be forgiven from this moment and that in the name of jesus they are bona fide recipients of your life empowered to live the victorious christian life knowing jesus loving jesus and living for him all the days of their lives i declare that the power of sin satan hell and the grave is broken over your life from tonight you walk in righteousness and you live victorious christian lives in jesus name we pray amen and amen please do me a favor by walking to my right that will be your left there are counselors who are waiting to have a word with you very briefly and then all of you will be back to your seats let's honor them koinonia Is that the best you can do? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, just one quick announcement. Next week, we're going to be waiting upon the Lord. 
We'll be fasting, so please make sure you plan this. The prayer focus will be sent by Saturday night, and then we'll all be fasting. Um, as always, children can fast. If they can stretch, why not? If they are tired, they can stop by 12 or 1. Get them something to eat. Hallelujah. And um, everyone should participate. Please make sure that it's part of the discipline that builds you. We don't fast carelessly. We fast with understanding. The reason why it is sent in the night is so that you can use your night time to start praying. You may not have all that time to pray during the day on Sunday. Maximize the night time. As soon as we work with the media to make sure at least by maybe 6 or 7 p.m. Saturday, the prayer focus is there and you receive it. Run with it. Pray it into your heart so that you become a manifestation of that which God desires. Have you been blessed tonight? I declare your week is blessed. Shout a believing amen. amen. May the hand of God rest upon you. In the name of Jesus, the results you have been waiting for, let this be the week that they manifest. I say it again, the testimonies you have been waiting for, let this be the week they manifest. The helpers you have been waiting for, let this be the week they manifest. In the name of Jesus Christ, everything that is not of God in your life, I drive it far from you. I place a mark of grace and honor upon your life Everywhere you go this week beginning be honored. Everywhere you go this week beginning be favored. Everywhere you go this week beginning be lifted. It will be clear through your life that it pays to serve Jesus. It will be clear through your life that it pays to love Jesus. In Jesus name we pray. Together let's share the grace in fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God. The sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, all the days of our lives as we dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Please greet and hug someone by your left and right and then see you next week.